if you came to, or if you thought this talk was going to, I'm going to show a visualization of a cloud and storm, you know, expanding and contracting like a pair of lungs. Sorry, that's not how it's going to look. I know, I know. <laughs> that's not really how it works. Um, but uh, this was probably to, to try to give uh, the non-specialists in the room um, an idea of what we're trying to quantify here with Blue Waters. Um, we're focusing on uh, the initial stages of, of uh, clouds and thunderstorms, and that's kind of uh, depicted here in this top photo um, that actually I took two years ago on the way to the Blue Waters Symposium. <laughs> uh, and then in the bottom photo, um, based on uh, Lee's talk, you're, you're probably focusing your eyes here or something, but actually I want you to focus in the dark gray down here. This is just precipitation, okay? And, and we're going to be quantifying um, what the cooling of that precipitation as it falls and its outflow, what, what that does. Um, the bulk of this work was done by graduate students in my, whoops, uh, graduate students in my group, uh, Dan Moser, Holly Mallison, and Brian Engelson. And I put a star behind Dan's um, name because he uh, finished his PhD in December and was hired by University of Texas Southwest Medical Center, their bioinformatics department, to do HPC. And I think that's kind of noteworthy because he, had, he knows nothing of bioinformatics, okay? So clearly they wanted him because of his experience in, uh, in running on Blue Waters. So uh, that's a nice testimony to what we can do for our students with this amazing tool. Okay, so to, to summarize kind of what the talk's going to be about here a little bit, um, we're worried about uh, the, um, the bringing in of air into a thunderstorm, the inhaling, so to speak, that I've depicted in red on this um, uh, diagram here. And by entrainment, okay, what I, so, well, first of all, there, there's major in, in, in a inflow coming into the storm, okay, that's the fuel of the storm. It's, it's bringing in hot, uh, moist air, and that's the fuel. But we also have this, these injections of dry air into the cloud called entrainment. And this happens just because of the overturning eddy motions bringing in that dry air into the cloud. And that's what gives the cloud its cauliflower appearance that you've all, you know, you've all seen before. And this is why we need really high resolution to study this problem, is uh, because we need to uh, represent directly as many of these eddies as possible. So that's kind of the inhaling stage. And then we also have the, what I'm going to call the exhaling uh, part. And this is the, the, the downdraft, the, the downward motions in the uh, thun thunderstorm uh, due to the precipitation falling, uh, created and falling, all right, and it comes to the ground, and then it kind of does a splat thing, all right, and this is what uh, Lee was earlier referring to as a cold pool. I'm just going to call it outflow here, all right, where the, the latent cooling of the air, either by melting hydrometeors or evaporating hydrometeors, cools that air and then it spreads out and it kind of makes a little mini cold front here. That can trigger new convection, okay, but there's a lot that's not understood about that yet either. And so that, that's where we're uh, trying to tackle here with some of our blue water studies. So I'm kind of looking at three different areas. So first of all, how much entrainment occurs in different stages of a supercell thunderstorm? And that requires high resolution simulations with high frequency output of large data files to quantify all this mass flux we're looking at. We then have another study where we're looking at how the spacing between clouds and storms affects the entrainment, okay, how much dry air they bring in. That too requires high resolution <laughs> simulations, high frequency output uh, to quantify that mass flux. And then finally, what kind of precipitation um, or kinds are most important for the strength of this uh, thunderstorm outflow that I'm talking about? Here we have the same as the others, but we're also needing to generate multiple real, uh, realizations, okay, to really uh, get at different scenarios and try to understand the generality of our results. And so for all of these, uh, Blue Waters has allowed us to pursue these questions that uh, heretofore have really not been pursued. Um, our model and, and analysis tools, um, I use the CM1 model as well, that is what Lee used and reported on earlier, it's George Bryan's model at NCAR. Um, I always like to throw out for the computer scientists in the uh, uh, audience that it's written in Fortran, it makes you all laugh, doesn't it? <laughs> but yes, we're still using Fortran. Um, I will also point out here that um, I use a, a more sophisticated microphysics scheme. Okay, this is how precipitation is created in a storm, uh, the, co the conversion of different phases of liquid water, and most models um, run at this high resolution would only be able to re represent it in terms of the mass. We have a double moment scheme where we uh, 
represented in terms of mass and number, so we get more information and better uh, accuracy on the production of precipitation. Again, you gotta have the computer power to do that, which we have here now. Our domain sizes that I'm reporting on here range from tens to hundreds of kilometers wide, grid spacings down to 50 meters or up to 250 in some cases and, and time steps often less than a tenth of a second. Whoops, hold on. Okay. So those are the base simulations and then we run our analysis codes on, on the output. Um, so for entrainment and understanding the dilution of the cloud due to entrainment, we, there's a published uh, triangulation algorithm to kind of find a, a, the core of the cloud to locate that in space, and then we calculate the mass flux uh, all around in 3D, all around into the core of that cloud. It requires high resolution output, like every three to six seconds. And this is clunky and runs on a single processor, but we've found that we can divide it um, into time segments then, and then you can spread the work around on many processors. Also for the, the, the outflow study, um, then we have a different set of uh, algorithms that we run to qu quantify the latent cooling uh, as the hydrometeors change phase, uh, melting, evaporation, and so on. Um, and I just put in this little visit clip here that um, Rob's probably cringing because this is really uh, elementary here. <laughs> but, but basically, um, to remind me to bring up the point that when we are trying to develop uh, new algorithms for understanding um, different scenarios that could happen and could mess up our algorithm. Visit with, it was really just useful as a tool for that as well to kind of say, oh wait, I never knew that those two things could happen at the same time. I gotta deal with that in my algorithm now. Or something that you assumed always did happen at the same time, you find through visit it doesn't. So we found that um, very useful. So for the first question, how much do uh, air do thunderstorms breathe in? Here's a couple of the simulations. Um, they're run for two and a half hours, um, three, over 300 million grid points. They require about 14,400 node hours, and each simulation makes about 60 terabytes of data, and we have scaled that down, as I'll talk about later. Um, what you're looking at is the total water mass, okay? So the hotter colors represent greater values of precipitation in the cloud. And you can uh, really uh, see the inhomogeneities in the, in the thunderstorm and in time, okay? Well, that is due in part to precipitation formation that falls out of the storm, but it's also due to entrainment, and that's what we're, we're quantifying. And so, uh, we, one of the questions we had asked um, is compared to, say, cumulus clouds that grow in an environment without uh, vertical wind shear, that is kind of more quiet winds uh, around the cloud, okay? And then if we look at developing thunderstorms, that those clouds develop in, in uh, an environment with strong vertical wind shear, where the winds often increase and, or even turn direction with height quite strongly, does that affect entrainment? Well, it's always been hypothesized that, why, well, yes, it does. And you can see that in simulations. You see the effects, but no one's been able to quantify that yet. We're now able to quantify that, okay? So we've been running these algorithms, and the, the main point here from this particular example is that if you compare the magnitudes of the max fluxes um, in the top panels, which is the no shear case, and this is five different simulations, you see they kind of top out around one, a magnitude of one here. Whereas if for these two simulations I just showed on the previous page, um, in a highly sheared environment, we're seeing magnitudes, you know, often three times as much, okay? And so we clearly need to represent entrainment properly then to understand what's going on in the thunderstorm and um, forecast its precipitation production um, accurately. Uh, for those uh, of you that are supercell thunderstorm junkies, okay, this is the pre-rotation stage. We're next looking at the rotation stage. There's a whole other body of literature that says entrainment should behave quite differently at those stages, and we're going after that next. Those are running. The second study was uh, looking at cloud spacing and how that might affect entrainment. Okay, so here uh, Daniel took, basically there's five hot spots you put in the model, and you move them farther apart or closer together, okay? So a cloud forms over each hot spot, and then you uh, look at how much those clouds are in training dry air around themselves into their, their uh, centers. And as you can imagine, if clouds are really spaced closely together, they're gonna start messing with each other. And so there's this hypothesis that closely spaced clouds develop more because they're protecting each other from this entrainment process. 
So that's we, what we went into this um, looking, uh, looking for, and we didn't quite get that. So here's the time series of the precipitation, the maximum rainfall in millimeters uh, versus time for uh, a variety of simulations with different cloud spacings. So the, the, the uh, runs with a cloud space closely together are, are the, the blue, different blue lines and the brown line. And what you'll notice is that they lag uh, precipitation production at first, up until the time of this vertical red line I put in here. So at first, the farther space clouds are raining, okay? And then, and, and the, sp the sp closely spaced clouds are not, or raining less. And then all of a sudden, things flip-flop. And the blue and the brown curves, the closely spaced clouds, now they're raining a lot more than the sp farther space clouds ever did. So we thought, ha, oh, yeah, we found it. You know, we're going to show that this is due to entrainment. It wasn't. Instead, it was an old notion um, about cloud uh, uh, precipitation outflows merging. So let me show you, uh, explain what this is. So this is a four-panel plot, time increasing from left to right, and then moving downward left to right. And so here's two clouds along the line, cloud three and cloud four. These are vertical cross-sections, and we can uh, see here that uh, the total water mass is again colored with uh, the hotter colors meaning more mass. We see cloud four is really putting out a lot of precipitation here. A little bit later, it still is, and now cloud three is precipitating as well. And notice what's happening in between them, okay? Basically, they precipitate, those cold outflows um, emerge, oh, and they um, join Okay, and they force a new cloud in between that becomes much stronger than the whole, whole first generation of clouds ever did. Okay, so we went looking for entrainment. We didn't find entrainment. Instead, we found a whole uh, uh, cloud merging kind of scenario. Um, this paper's in re uh, review right now, in second review, and our re the reviewers uh, were quite excited by this because we were able to kind of start to pinpoint at what cloud separation distis distance this is becoming important. And then finally, a little bit more on these precipitation outflows, now on the thunderstorm scale. Uh, so for these simulations, these are like three and a half to six hour simulations. Um, we did 10 of these because here we're having to do lots of sensitivity studies. And so there's the stats for, for each um, simulation. What I'm showing here on the left is a time series of simulated radar reflectivity. This is what the precipitation at the ground looked like if you would have a radar showing um, what, what these simulated storms were doing. On the right side is the cold pool that's being produced, the outflow, so that the darker blues are colder, and sometimes we're getting as much as 8 degrees Kelvin, or 8 Kelvin, less than the environment. So we're, it's putting out a lot of cold air here, and you can see with our high resolution how we can um, find a lot of the inhomogeneities here as well. So there's a, a still frame then of, of uh, what we're going to look at next. So this is the control case, okay, and I'm going to next just show these kinds of plots where if you notice the black outline, okay, is basically the outline of this cold pool up here, okay, superimposed on the simulated radar reflectivity. So we did nine more, like I said, and what we're doing here is we're just tweaking differences um, in the model about how precipitation is created or some characteristics that kind of we know alter uh, precipitation. Um, and so uh, I won't go into these details here, but you see we get a, ni a nice variety. So now we have 10 simulations. We can start to kind of pull out some general relationships. So one of those, for example, is looking at how fast that outflow propagates outward. Okay, that can help tell us something about um, if it's going to be able to trigger new storms and new convection. This is something that the parameterization people uh, for the global models as well as uh, uh, the larger scale forecasting models, they want to know. They want to be able to parameterize this kind of information. So when we integrated the latent cooling terms in the downdrafts <laughs> that contributing to this outflow, um, for 10 minutes and then uh, plotted it versus the propagation speed of this outflow, we're starting to find a nice relationship here, okay? You would like it to be right along the line, of course, but life's a little more uh, complicated than that. Moreover, and this is also uh, the first of its kind here, where we were able to tease out what individual terms in the downdraft were contributing the most to cooling of that air. So we're looking at the melting of grapple, uh, for the non-expert, grapples that little spongy white ice that sometimes falls out of thunderstorms, okay? Um, 
we're uh, finding that the melting of grapple and even the sublimation, it's like evaporation but for ice, okay, are dominating the cooling of these downdrafts and then some rain evaporation, and then there was a little bit of hail in this storm, but it was a very minor contributor. Um, so we're looking at, uh, th this is for the control case, and we're still looking at this for the nine other simulations, but we're trying to, again, build up some statistics and, and some general relationships to help out larger scale models. Okay, so, um, so some of our challenges and some of our simple fixes, I thought I'd go through this, especially if there are students in the room new to high performance computing. Some of the, everyone else will probably be shaking their head saying, Sonia, I can't believe you said that because they're so obvious, but here we go, okay? So, you know, you often have uh, slow I.O. problems or NCL routines that you're analyzing your data, you, running out of memory, output fewer variables, okay? <laughs> I, I mean, this is, it is a no-brainer, right? But I think people don't often think about that, okay? They, they just want to go ahead and use the whole uh, variety of variables. And, and these models output, you know, everything under the sun, right? But I know I'm going to maybe only use this 25% of those variables, right? So why not go ahead from the outset, scale it down, okay? Um, now, it is kind of a game of chicken, right? Because if you, if you, don't output everything, and then later you find out, oh, that's the variable I need right there. Did I output it? No. <laughs> then you have to rerun the simulation, right? So you got to be a little careful with this. But we, um, for these particular problems, we, we've had a lot of success in, in doing that. Um, to increase our an analysis speed with visit and other NCL co codes, we we'd say what well, we trim the data files. So um, I imagine most disciplines do this. I mean, you want to keep your feature in the center of the domain, so you have the huge white space all around you know the uh, the edges of the domain. There's no need for us to keep that in the analysis stage. So we've just you know made some simple codes and we just trim it. So I ask every one of my students, make sure you trim your data. Okay. Now you're reading in smaller volumes of data and you're also storing smaller volumes of data. Um, here's something that I hope to talk about with some people uh, more after lunch because I saw some good examples of this, but like uh, Lee's uh, vortex tubes as well as uh, Susan's um, atmospheric rivers. Searching large domains for continuous surfaces meeting, cert meeting certain criteria, like here I went latent cooling in downdrafts, but only the downdrafts that are touching the ground. Um, so we have some really inelegant routines right now, and I'd love to talk to other people about how they're you know, sorting through their data that well. And then, of course, storage of all the data files while we analyze them. It's still a problem, but we're, we're doing uh, what we can here, and, and we're, you know, uh, we found some solutions. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions. I'll pop up my acknowledgments here, and I'll leave you with one last picture of uh, one of our storms. Thank you.